All right. Welcome to the Gazelle School of Business webinar on selling your story. This is one of many free webinars we're offering to the piano service industry that will cover every topic you can imagine related to building and running a piano service business. So our team will be monitoring the chat and Q&A. So ask your questions there and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. All right, so let's dive right in. If you're going to invest in your business, you deserve to have your best customers amplifying your story. And this is about more than just doing good work or asking for online reviews. You need to know how to share the story of your business in a compelling way if you want people to listen. And if this is your first time joining one of our webinars, <clears throat> I'm George, and I'm here tonight with Timothy Barnes and the team at Gazelle, where we help you save time while your customers and grow your piano service business. Hey, George, I'm glad to be here. Uh, you know, the truth is being good at selling your story isn't something that you do overnight. Uh, this is a multi-year journey that starts the day you decide to apply the things that we're going to teach you in this webinar. And Luke is going to go ahead and drop a link in the chat to a handout just with additional resources you can use later to help apply the concepts that we're going to be covering. So if you have never intentionally thought about how the story your business tells can be used as one of your biggest marketing tools, well, the truth is there's going to be a lot of low hanging fruit for you as you apply this webinar tonight uh, that you could probably apply tomorrow or next week uh, just to start getting immediate results. But to go from someone who struggles with sharing the story of your business to an oracle who always seems to have the right words to say, this is going to take some time and practice. Yeah, it starts with every appointment you do tomorrow, then all the customers you engage with next week, and soon you find yourself changing up the words on your website, building a brand, and consistently applying these things over and over again with each of your customers. At the end of this journey, you are going to have a clear vision, a clear brand, a strong business identity, effective storytelling tools, increased confidence, a business one-liner that succinctly communicates the value you provide to all your customers. And with all of this, you become somebody who always seems to have the right words to say. Now, telling your story is easy. All you have to do is find the right problem to solve, use the right words, and start getting better results in everything you do. Let's begin with finding the right problem to solve. Every good story has a problem, a challenge that needs to be overcome. This is why your customers contact you to ask for help with their piano. So ask yourself, what problem is your business solving? Answering this question is key to telling the story of your business. But if you can't articulate the answer to this question instantly, then the story your business needs to be telling is probably not the story you are telling today, which means the first step you need to take is to spend some time identifying the problem your business is trying to solve. And this should be crystal clear in your mind as the business owner and always on the tip of your tongue. So take a moment to think back to the last person who asked you directly, you know, so tell me, uh, what do you do? Or the last customer who contacted you and just pointedly asked how your business was different from someone else in the area, right? How did you respond? Because how you currently tell the story of your business will reveal a lot about the problem your business is trying to solve right now. And when a business is unclear what problem they're solving, or they are struggling to tell their story or trying to solve the wrong problem, this usually comes across a few different ways. So yeah, we were gonna consider a few different stories that you could tell about your business. So here's some possible stories. 
The most common thing you see on everyone's website is a history lesson about the day their business started. Uh, something about your training and the journey you went on to become a piano technician. Uh, then some kind of attempt to tie this into a reason why this means that they should trust you to work on their piano. And this often includes things like your years of experience, or perhaps your skill as an oral turn tuner, or your status as a second generation technician, the kind of services you offer, a statement about how hard you work, your level of quality. And for some people, the price they charge is the most important story they tell about their business. And others, it's their certifications, right? Like being a registered piano technician or talking about the school you went to or the quality of your training, a slew of other things. You see, when these kinds of stories become the primary way that you choose to present the story of your business, you quickly discover that they all have a fundamental flaw. You. It's all about you, your qualifications, your history, your services, your skill, on and on, you, you, you. These are all stories you can tell, but they are poor representations of the story you need to be telling about your business. There is a better way. And George, the scary truth is, if this is how you are telling the story of your business, you are telling a self-centered and forgettable story. Now, we don't want this for you. We actually want you to do the opposite and tell your customers a remarkable and memorable story about your business. So if this is what you don't need to do, the story you need to be telling is about your customer and about a real problem they have in their life. It is a story about how the work you do provides value to them by solving this problem and by making it easy for them to transform from somebody who has this problem into somebody who is able to receive the full benefit of having this problem solved. So imagine you're at a dinner party and someone asks, so what do you do? Or you're on the phone with a new customer and they say, well, it looks like you do the exact same thing as everybody else in the area. Why should I do business with you? So instead of starting the conversation by saying what you do, differentiate yourself by stating the most important problem you solve in your customers' lives and package it in the form of a story. So let's give you a few examples to show you what this sounds like in real life. You could say something like, well, you know how families are struggling to find ways to spend time together these days? I gather families around the piano. I'm the person who makes that piano more enjoyable to play so they can build memories having a good time around their piano. Now, if this is how you choose to describe the value you're providing in your community, then the problem you're using at the center point of your marketing, the problem your business is solving, is called disconnected families. What you're saying is, the most important thing about my business is not what I do, it's why I do it. I just happen to have a gift called making pianos sound amazing, and I choose to apply it in this business because I want to spend my career helping gather families and musicians around their piano. Because it's just wrong for anyone to go their entire life and never experience the power and laughter that gets unleashed when the people you love are gathered around your piano. This is your mission, right? This gets at why the services you offer matters in the overall course of your customers' lives. Now, in this statement, gathering families around the piano, making it enjoyable to play, and having a good time are the key brand words that differentiate and describe the problem your business is trying to solve. This isn't about having an in-tune piano. This is a story about having a properly serviced piano is going to positively impact the broader spectrum of your life. You and your business exist to help give your customers a tool they can use to connect with the people they love, a functioning piano. This is the story arc of this fictional company. And a different way that you might choose to solve a different problem might actually sound something like this, and it's called stressed, solving the problem of stressed out people. Uh, and so it sounds like this, you know, do you know how stressed people are th these days? I help them unwind with music. I make pianos sound great and fun to play, so anyone who wants to be a better pianist can achieve this dream. So in this brand, helping you unwind with music, fun to play, and achieving your dreams is central to the brand story and the problem you're solving through your business. 
Now ask yourself, what is the major difference between sharing the story of your business this way and the way you've been trying to do it? What's more remarkable, being a qualified professional in your trade or bringing families together? Helping musicians enjoy their art and inspiring people to realize their musical aspirations or being a certified professional who knows how to regulate and voice. See, both are important stories to tell, but only one of these stories should be the focal point of your marketing. The fact that you know how to do your job is secondary to the story that you are the kind of person who solves a problem, but not just any problem. When you tell a story, you have the option of focusing on three different types of problems, external, internal, and philosophical. The best stories begin with the philosophical problem and work backwards, showing you how solving your philosophical problem actually solves all three of these problems. Now, external problems are the ones most customers are aware of and will verbalize, right? The piano's out of tune. The piano teacher said, I needed to tune it, right? We moved and it needs to be tuned. When you pick up the phone, your customer is going to immediately tell you their external problem and ask if you can fix it. But there's always a deeper problem present that they often don't verbalize. It is their internal problem. This is how they feel about their external problem, right? I feel ashamed that I have let my piano go so long. I feel embarrassed when my mom comes over and I haven't taken care of the piano she gave us. I'm scared that if I don't do what my child's music teacher says, that my son or daughter will not develop as a musician. As a business, if you identify, acknowledge, and speak to their internal problem, you will almost always increase your sales. It is a stronger motivator in the lives of your customers. So just saying something like, you know, no worries, Mrs. Smith. Yes, I can tune and service your piano. And I know you must be scared that neglecting your piano all these years has caused some kind of long-term damage, but I know everything your piano is going to need and I'm going to take really good care of it. This kind of response that speaks both to how your customers feel about their external problem and that promises them you can actually solve their external problem that they asked about, this is called selling to the internal problem. There's a deeper and more powerful problem still in existence that you can speak to, and it's the philosophical problem. And this is where you wanna focus all your branding and marketing. The philosophical problem is the story about something even larger than the story itself. It's the question of why. Why does this story matter in the overall course of your customer's life? For example, I shouldn't have to be a concert pianist to enjoy my music. If I'm going to invest all this time practicing, I deserve to not have my piano be a stumbling block. It's using words like, I shouldn't have to do this to achieve this. If I do this, I at least deserve this outcome. Or if I want this outcome, I ought to do this. Saying things like, it's just wrong for someone to live their entire life and never fill in the blank. The better your philosophical problem, the better your audience will respond because it speaks to why they choose to own and why they ultimately service their piano. It speaks to their aspirational identity as a person, who they want to be and hope to become, and who the piano says they are. It also speaks to how this piano fits into their life and goals. This is why we use the example earlier by saying, you know how most people feel disconnected these days? We open with that as our philosophical problem because it's far more powerful of a story than mere people can relate to. And it's more memorable than just, hey, do you know I fix pianos? Stories built around an external problem are easily forgettable. But stories built around philosophical problems resonate in ways the average person will remember and more importantly, internalize because they've identified with it. So when new customers go to your website and read about the philosophical problem you have chosen as the focal point of your brand, 
they feel this emotional pull that just says louder and louder, yes, this business gets me. I want to do business with them. And when you tell a story this way, your customer self identifies themselves as a character in your story who has a problem. And instead of your story being all about you, something special happens. You become the guide, not the hero. A guide who is poised and ready to help them solve all three of the problems in their life. Now, we're summarizing a lot of these concepts from Story Brand by Don Miller, and we highly recommend reading it. So when you tell your story this way, <clears throat> your customer becomes the hero in their own story. You just happen to become a guide who helps them discover the path to achieving this thing they now want, their vision for a better life, their musical aspiration. And you do this by helping them see how the services you provide help them solve their philosophical problem while also solving their internal problem so they no longer have to feel bad about how their piano is being taken care of. And you simultaneously solve their external problem because their piano gets tuned and it performs better than it ever has in the past. All because they happen to meet a qualified guide who gave them a plan. And the plan you are going to give them is really simple. Step one, have me service your piano. Step two, enjoy it on a deeper level. And step three, gather your family and friends and develop deeper connections with the people you love. In the story you are telling, they are the hero because they are the one who decides to do something about their problem in their life. All you did was say, if you're the kind of person who feels disconnected from the people you love and you happen to own a piano, I can help you achieve this so you can gather around your piano and connect with the people you love in a new, exciting, and deeply personal way. It's called live music, and having it in your life is something that has enchanted people for thousands of years. Are you interested? If so, book now. Now, most business owners get stuck here trying to solve the wrong problem. The problem they're trying to solve sounds something like, my customer lacks knowledge about their piano. They're uneducated. Therefore, I need to tell them how their piano works or isn't working because I want them to buy a regulation, tune it more often, take better care of it, fill in the blank. If this is you, the biggest problem you solve in your customer's life is an external problem called lack of knowledge. So you drown them in words they often can't even understand by introducing them to your complicated solution because the biggest problem you see is that they're uneducated. This isn't gonna go well. But when you get your hands around the right problem, it suddenly becomes easier to communicate the value your business provides and enables you to adapt the story of your business to help solve a variety of common problems different customers experience. In other words, if you do this well, you will tell a memorable story instead of a forgettable one. You can even turn someone at a dinner party who doesn't own a piano, doesn't play the piano, and can't carry a tune in a bucket into a raving evangelist for your business by simply saying, you know how anytime someone wants to improve something, they add music? Well, behind every musician is a piano, and I'm the person who makes that piano more enjoyable to play so they can build memories having a good time around their piano. Now, the reason this person who will never be one of your customers is going to spread the word about your business is because you gave them a memorable story. They will now say, hey, I know a guy and actually remember what you do the next time that they discover one of their friends owns a piano. All because you enabled this person to become the guide in someone else's story. And this is the ultimate word of mouth. You don't need to service somebody's piano to be recommended. You just have to be memorable. And it happens when you speak to a philosophical problem that pinpoints the value your business provides. In this case, the story that will be remembered is that you are the kind of person who helps musicians achieve their dreams by giving them an enjoyable piano so they can build positive memories. 
This is what will be remembered. And the very next question in this conversation will be, cool, how exactly do you do that? And that is where you get to say, by tuning and repairing their piano and inspiring them to play more. It's a really fun career. Hey, tell me what you do. Now, learning how to lead into this conversation in this way is quite easy because it's formulaic. All you have to do is memorize the phrase, most people have this problem in their life. I solve this in this way so they can have a better life. Then learn to insert the philosophical problem, not the external one that you solve in your customers' lives. So don't say, you know, most people have an out-of-tune piano. Say, you know how most people are disconnected these days? Boom. There is the philosophical problem your business solves. And the person you are talking to is going to be able to relate to this and is going to give you all of their attention while they wait to hear how in the world you solve this problem called disconnection. And remember, when you're talking to a piano owner, the right problem to solve isn't always the one your customer sees, but it's always the one they feel deep in their soul. And when you speak to this, they'll, they'll step back and say, yeah, yeah, I've always dreamed of connecting with my family around the piano. And because they've now connected you fixing their piano as the way that they get to fill this bigger need in their life, this is the point where they go from wanting someone generic to fix their external problem to wanting you to be the one they, they choose to fix their piano. See, everyone else just offers to tune their piano. But they'll hire, they'll, they'll want to hire you because you help them to connect what having an in-tune piano could do for them in the bigger scheme of their life, all because you spoke of it in such a way it caused you to stand out in a crowd and guided them to a deeper understanding, which is exactly why you need to find the right problem to solve. And this leads us to our second point. Use the right words to share your story. So let's talk about the seven elements of story you need to be familiar with and how to verbalize each one in the story you choose to tell about your business. Now, every great story guides the listener by introducing them to a character. And this is your customer, not you and not your business. This story is about them, their piano, and their hopes and dreams for how this piano fits into their life. Your customer is the character at the center of the story you choose to tell about your business. The second thing you need to do is introduce this person to a problem. We did this earlier by simply saying, do you know how most people feel disconnected these days? And just like that, we have a character and they have a philosophical problem called disconnection. Next, they're going to meet a guide with a plan, and you just happen to be standing here, right? A guide who has a great plan for how to easily solve this problem. I gather families around the piano, and I'm the person who can help you do this so you can live a better life. In other words, if you own a piano and you follow my plan, I can give you the tools you need to gather your family around the piano. And we said this earlier, but your plan is really simple and sounds something like this. Step one, tune and service your piano. This is so easy, right? This is something they can actually take action on today. Just schedule an appointment. Go online, choose your service, pick a date and schedule. Done, right? You've completed step one. Congratulations. And now you are ready for step two of my plan. So step two is to make it easier to play by allowing me to do some regulation and voicing. Trust me, this is what will make all the difference in the world. Step three, share your music with your family. You will gain confidence by having a piano that inspires you to play. Then all you have to do is gather everyone together for five minutes to play something you've been working on. Next thing you know, five minutes turns into a night of sing-alongs, laughter, and fun. Now, notice how none of these steps involve any technical mumbo jumbo. It's just do this, then trust me to do this. And the next thing you know, you will be reaching your aspirational identity and be the kind of person who does this thing you've always wanted to do. 
The point is to teach them how easy this can be when they trust you and then call them to action. And all stories need a call to action. This is usually a big book now button on your website. You have a problem? I have an easy solution. Book now. But having a plan and a clear call to action isn't enough to convince most people to book. You need to also verbalize it for them. The risk of failure. You need to verbalize the risk of failure that they encounter if they choose not to do anything. And you don't need to over-dramatize this. It's just, if you do nothing, your piano is never going to sound great and you'll cringe every time you sit down to play. Or uh, if you do nothing, you'll go through life thinking you can't play well. There's always a risk at doing nothing and you need to spell this out for them. But you don't need to linger here long because there's also a celebration to be had if they choose to do your call to action and book an appointment they have a hope of success. So tell them in words what success looks like. In this case, being a successful pianist is about discovering music that enhances your life. Or being a successful pianist doesn't have to mean you become a concert musician. It just means that you are the person in your family who gathers people around your piano. And lastly, you need to verbalize for your customers a promise of transformation. If you have this problem and you follow my plan, you'll avoid failure, find success, and you'll transform from someone who only dreams about gathering people around your piano into someone who builds the kind of memories you always dreamed of giving your children and grandkids. So just fill in the blank. If you do this, you will go from this to this. So these are the seven elements of the story that your business needs to touch on effectively, to effectively communicate your story in a memorable and repeatable way. You don't have to always tell them in this order, uh, but it does make more sense to our brains when it's presented in this way. Character, problem, meets a guide who has a plan and calls them to action, warns them of the risk, inspires them with the hope of success by opening their eyes to the kind of transformation that will happen if they choose to go on this journey with you. And do you know where most businesses struggle? It's here. Either they make themselves, not the customer, the center of the story that they try to solve, or they try to solve the wrong problems. If you want people to want to use you, don't make yourself the center of the story. Don't tell them the biggest problem they have is a lack of education about how their piano works and the technical steps they need to take to make it sound better. Instead, inspire them to be the kind of person who uses music to bring people together and then be the guide who helps get them there. So with these elements of story, each working together to communicate the value your business provides, it's time to develop your business one-liner. It ties the whole story together clearly and succinctly. And honestly, for folks attending this webinar and, and those of you watching later, if you do this exercise and you want some interactive feedback, please just email me. You can email me at george at gazelleapp.io. Uh, I love doing this kind of stuff. So send me your one-liner and the outline of your story uh, that you've decided to tell about your business, and I will be happy to give you some valuable, honest, and constructive feedback. Uh, and hopefully it will help you further refine the story you're trying to tell. So a great one-liner is essentially a summary statement that uses these three parts of your story, but the character, the problem, and the promise of transformation. Now, the story you're selling here isn't that you fix pianos. It's deeper and more memorable than that, and it's designed to get your audience asking to know more. So when you think about it this way, it's easy to craft a powerful one-liner for your business that implants in your customer's mind the idea that you call yourself a piano technician because badass miracle worker isn't an official job title. This makes them smile because they feel that they connected with you and your business in a way that's far deeper than the external problem they started out asking about. So going back to the example from earlier, the character in our one-liner that we have here, our example, is essentially families. And the problem is that families are struggling to find meaningful ways to connect and spend time together. So as their guide, your plan will result in 
an enjoyable piano that's more accessible to people who don't know how to play, uh, which will create a shared space for being together. So you promise a transformation that will enable them to build memories having a good time around their piano. And if you step back and think about this, the character, the problem, and the transformation are the most important parts of the story because these are the ways you differentiate your business from everybody else. Because when it comes to meeting a guide to the plan, we're all in the same industry. You and your business are always going to be positioning yourself as the guide. And the plans are all going to sound pretty similar. You know, decide to get your piano serviced, pick a date, book me now. Almost every one of the participants in this webinar, every member of PTG, every registered and unregistered piano tech will have a business offering and a similar sounding plan. But the elements you choose for the character, problem, and transformation in your story will set you apart, should set you apart. They become the cornerstone of your brand, your trademarks, the content on your website. These are the most important and unique parts of your story. And using this approach will result in a great one-liner that is engaging and memorable. But if you're not touching on all seven of these elements of your story on your website, and in the words you use to describe your business, then your story probably isn't being heard and definitely isn't being shared as much as it could be. All right, so let's assume that you do this. And you have a great story that touches on all seven of these things. You lay it out on your website and you develop an awesome business one-liner that just clearly and succinctly takes the character, the problem and the transformation and, and you memorize it so you're ready. And the next conversation you have, you're gonna use it, right? Now it's easy to do the next step and develop a word bank for the story that your brand is telling. And by this point, you have a brand. You might not have a logo, you might not know what colors represent your company, but your business has a story and that is the beginning of a brand. So let's use our example from earlier. In our first example, there were six primary words that we used to capture the idea of the story we were telling. The gather, your family, enjoy or enjoyable, having a good time, being around your piano and the idea of time spent together. After you craft your one-liner, look at it and identify your keywords and use two or three of them every time you do any marketing in your business. And next grab a thesaurus and write down secondary ways you can use that you can describe the same ideas. So you can get some variety and adapt to more situations without veering away from your core brand story. Uh, for example, things like the words surround, loved ones, connect, relax, unwind, musical aspiration, the idea of being present, memories. This word bank, along with your branding, are gonna help you be more consistent in the ways you market the story of your business. Because you now have 10 to 15 words that are easy to memorize and to drop into conversation. It, it, you can drop it in an email or text messages that you're sending to someone, anybody who's interested in your business. Which leads us to our final step. Get better results. When you have a good one-liner, you can easily get to the core of what people want to hear and know about your business. You can easily get to your tribe because they self-identify with your story. And with a great one-liner, you can easily turn anyone into an evangelist for your business. So most customers don't understand when you talk about their piano, but having a great story helps them understand and it helps them internalize the value you provide in their life. And if you have a website, it is definitely time to update it. Now, next month, our Gazelle School of Business webinar is all about building a powerful and simple website. And if you wanna see what this looks like and feels like to use these story brand concepts in real life, check out demopianoservice.com and see if you can identify the various elements of story that we used to create this fictitious brand. 
and then register to attend our webinar next month to learn how to easily build a powerful and simple website. A great story also helps you grow because it brings more people into your business. It differentiates you from the competition and it gives new customers clarity about what kind of service they can expect from your business and how you will solve their problem. A great story helps your customers, your best customers, tell your story to their friends in a way everybody can understand and remember. This is important because the majority of the time, your story isn't being told by the words coming out of your mouth. The majority of the time, it is being told by your customers or your website. They remember, I help people gather around the piano. They don't remember the words like regulation and voicing that describe the way in which you do this. They can easily tell one story, but not the other. All because you took the time to make it easy to understand, easy to repeat, and structured in a way their brain was naturally able to process and remember the information. And this will even help you turn non-customers into raving fans because they'll remember the story of how you're the kind of person who guides people to solutions by working on their piano. So instead of forgetting your story, they'll remember it and share it with others. Another great way that story helps is that it gives you clarity and helps them, your customers, actually hear your message. You no longer spend as much time scratching your head and trying to search for the words when you're trying to create ads. You know, whether you're talking with your customers in person, writing an ad, or improving your website, I used to spend so much time just wondering how in the world to communicate this idea I was trying to tell. The, the reality was I was just confused about the story my business was telling all along. And once I clarified it, all right, over time, I got better at telling that story in all forms. And over time, using your story to speak more clearly to your customers will just become second nature to you. So a great story also helps you focus your business decisions because it gives you clarity about your purpose. So a business focused on gather people around the piano doesn't need to get into the piano storage business. And they might offer piano moving services uh, and need to temporarily provide storage solutions as a way to help people gather around their piano after a home renovation. But phrasing it this way is important because it gives you more clarity around your purpose, right? And piano storage becomes a secondary, not a primary service you offer. So telling a self-focused, forgettable story about your business is gonna result in failure. It means always fumbling for words and never knowing what to say. You know, watching your business stagnate, having less wind in your sails. It looks like you telling someone that you tune pianos and the result is that they make a joke about a tuna fish instead of making a plan to tell their friends. But having a great story for every conversation means you never have to fumble for the right words. You're able to share your story in a compelling and effective way. So write your one-liner today, identify your story, make your word bank, and most importantly, use it, practice it, and refine it until you're so comfortable, it's second nature to share the problem your business solves and the solution you provide using the seven elements of story. There is no question that having a great story will help you grow your business and build your brand. And you can go from someone who has a forgettable brand into someone who has an engaging story that drives the growth of their business. So while we transition to the Q&A and our team sorts through questions, um, here's a quick poll and a list of upcoming webinars that are coming soon. So here at Gazelle, we focus on technicians that are frustrated by inefficient scheduling of appointments or struggling to keep up with sending out estimates and invoices on time or lacking enough monthly revenue to consistently be profitable. You know, if any of these resonate for you, um, raise your hand. You know, polls make this really easy. 
and send us a quick chat if you'd like more information about Gazelle. We'd love to talk to you. And you can visit growwithgazelle.com backslash school to listen to previous webinars. And you can sign up for next month's webinar on building a powerful and simple website. And we're going to be covering every topic you can imagine related to building and running a piano service business. The team of Gazelle is excited to help you find the tools you need to save your time and wow your customers so that you can focus on growing your business and doing what you enjoy most. All right. Thank you, George and Tim. Um, that was fantastic. Um, as you guys have been talking, we've got a lot of feedback rolling in here. Um, looks like a, a lot of people on the poll are wanting help creating one-liners. So I think uh, that resonated with a lot of people. Um, we've also got a bunch of questions coming in here. Um, so uh, I think um, we can probably just roll on with the Q&A. Um, and um, let me just uh, start with some of the questions we've got here. So we've got one person asks, um, if the story I tell should be focused on the customer, where do my certifications fit in? Or do I not bother to mention them? That's a really good question. I, I think first, if you're telling the story of your customer and the problem that you're trying to, that, that, that they're dealing with, that you are helping them to solve, then when they meet a guide, which is you, that's where your certifications would come in. But the reality is you don't need to tell them about your certifications because you're showing them a plan. The minute you identified the problem that they're dealing with, that was certification enough for them in their mind. Now, there's also places where you would put your certifications if you'd like to on your website or things like that. And Tim can actually give more speaking to that actually. But I think when you're telling your story, you'll find that your certifications, oftentimes when people want to list their certifications, it's a way to prove that they're capable and that they are the person that should be chosen. And what we're, put, what we're positing is that you become that person when you identify the problem for them. Yeah. I think a, a good way to think about this is that your certifications are secondary to the brand of your business. Um, and so if your certifications are the primary story you're telling, you're essentially solving an external problem. So you would never want them to be the, four, you know, you're not going to meet somebody and, you know, what do you do? Well, I'm a certified professional. Great. So is everybody else in the room, right? If every house party was like that, nobody would really enjoy talking to people. Um, and so the certifications are important. I, you know, so I don't want you to go out of here and just say, like, oh, I never need to get them and I shouldn't have them. Because when you are positioning yourself as the guide, it is part of what makes you a qualified guide. Yeah. But like George was saying, they actually decide if they want to do business with you based off more whether or not you're solving a problem they can self-identify with. And then if you're a guide who is certified, oh my goodness, it's just even better. Of course I can trust you. Um, I've heard it said that you never want to hire a personal trainer who is obese, right? And so even if somebody came up to me and you know, they're like, hey, I'm a personal trainer and you know, I've gotten so many people to lose X amount of weight and I'm a certified personal trainer, I'm kind of looking at them going, yeah, but I don't want you to teach me how to lose weight because I'm kind of questioning whether you're qualified. It's the same kind of thing when you're meeting somebody for the first time, right? They decide, hey, I want to lose weight. I want to do this. I've identified this part of your story. Um, and then they're kind of looking at you like, hold on, can I trust you? And that's the point to bring in your certifications. But it is in the right place, in the right order, and you being a qualified guide. And let's just assume that they meet two businesses that do this well that have good brands, that have great stories, that lead with a philosophical problem, then they make the customer the center of the story and they present a problem and they're both qualified guides, but one has certifications. Right there, one of these guides is more qualified to get me to my end goal. That's where your certifications fit in. We have another question here. Um... Uh, he writes in and says, is it good to relate past famous customers that you've helped get their piano in great working condition? For example, a famous musician or famous people in the area that you've worked with? So I'm going to take that question. I'm going to take it a step back as well. Um, and, and it really is the question of quotes and the so, so both quotes from anybody, 
names of people who you have who are famous. Um, and I would say some of your best quotes and some of your best things like that are ones that speak to the external, to, not to the external, ones that speak to the philosophical problem that you help solve. So if you've given your customers the language of the problem you solve, you'll also find that sometimes when they write a review, this language will come back to you. And those makes for some great quotes. Um, and if that quote can come from somebody who's famous, great. Um, so I would say the question I would have for you is actually whether or not the philosophical problem that you're dealing with has to do with the fame, the prestige of somebody who plays a piano. Um, if that's part of the story of your business, then maybe that is the right, the right, right thing to do. But just throwing a name, um, it's like certifications, just throwing a name on your website uh, without it actually having anything to do with the story of your business. It's just like a certification in that it's secondary to the story. Yeah, this is uh, the idea of social proof is important and is helpful. We actually did an entire webinar uh, a couple of months ago on just getting online reviews. These are absolutely critical. Here's what's really fun. When you've properly branded the story of your business, like George said, your online reviews start changing. They start regurgitating the story of your business because it's memorable back in the online reviews. And then you can start cherry picking some of those reviews that actually build even more social proof for why you're a qualified guide. And if you watch any of Don Miller's material, if you read his book, um, I, I don't remember which interview it was in, but he was doing an interview once and he's like, this is really like uh, the idea of dating. And you would never ask somebody to marry you on the first date, um, or maybe you would, and you know, you're just so enamored with them. You're like, hey, go on a date with me. Will you marry me? And they're like, no, that's a little creepy. It's like, okay, well, will you go on another date with me? And it's like, okay, well, yeah. So you go on another date and it's like, hey, will you marry me? And they're like, no, I still don't know you very well. So it's like, all right, well, will you go on another date with me? And then you go on another date and another date and another date. And then you're like, okay, well, where you, will you marry me? In the context of this, the question, will you book now, is really that some people will actually book now immediately after reading your philosophical problem. They're just going to assume everything else is like great because you, they identified with that philosophical problem. They were ready to go and boom, they booked. Uh, the speed at which people booked when I did this in my own company was just radically different. And I actually had a different problem, which people weren't actually getting to the bottom of the page to book. They were just reading that philosophical problem and booking. But some people like to do their research. And so the way we structured it was you had that character who has a problem, who meets a guide. So they've already identified the problem. They've met me. I've given them my plan and I've told them the risk. And they've had multiple times to book now. I've told them what success looks like. They get another chance to book now. And then if you're still not convinced, that's where I put all of my social proof, all of my online reviews. And I cherry picked the reviews that A, told the story of my business really well. And then also we actually bucketed a lot of the stuff we'll talk about next at the next webinar, but we bucketed things into like, you know, people who use their piano casually versus piano teachers. So on my casual use page, I had a lot of reviews of people who casually use their piano saying we gathered it around more. Um, on my piano teacher page, I had reviews from piano teachers because I was giving social proof to the group and the idea of the person um, that was on that page. And then at the very bottom is the transformation. And so if you look at the demo piano service website, absolutely, you're going to see that there is social proof. There's online reviews scattered throughout the site. And like George said, cherry pick it. And if the primary part of your brand is that you, you know, you do concert halls and you do big names, you do big universities, then obviously having big names reviewing you, hopefully in your brand words, is going to be the most powerful social proof you could get. Use it. We've got uh, two questions in here that came in that are uh, very similar and related. So I'm going to ask them together. Um, it says, um, can you give us a negative example of a one-liner and explain why it's not good? Um, and then similarly, we have somebody else asking for more examples of one-liners. Just yeah, to put you on the spot um, there. I know you. Can. <laughs> uh, I'll take the negative one-liner, George. I'll let you throw out all the uh, positive one-liners. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, get those creative things. juices flowing here. Right, that's uh, right. Here, here's what I will say. This takes work. Okay, 
And so um, it's not the kind of thing where it, I remember when I was first doing this, I had that exact question. And I was, I was sitting there and I was just like, ah, I, I can't even like figure out how this works. And so a negative one-liner is going to hit on the external problem. That's easy, right? Um, somebody asked, what do you do? I fix pianos. This is a negative one-liner already. They've already forgotten you, okay? Um, a negative one-liner is something, you know, well, to be honest, it's leading with the secondary story, right? I'm a certified professional. This is a story all about you. A negative one-liner is anything that starts with you and fails to actually talk about the transformation. And so it makes you the center of the story and then the transformation either is absent or it's all about you. So if I'm gonna start a story with a character and a problem where I'm the character and I had a problem called, I didn't know how to work on pianos and I learned how to work on pianos. And the transformation is I went from somebody who didn't know how to work on pianos to somebody who now works on a lot of pianos, including these big names, the people that you should be impressed by. Aren't I great? Will you do business with me? It's kind of like, I feel like this is all about you. So a negative one-liner is going to start with you and end with you and never give your customer space to actually identify themselves as a character. And it sucks all the air out of the room and nobody, you know, this is actually when you're talking to people and they make a joke about a tuna fish. They've lost interest. It's like, okay, you've, you've all talked to people like this. It's like you're at a party and then somebody starts going off about how I'm great and me and me and I'm awesome and this and that and me and me and me. And it's like, it's like, okay, great. Glad you're a certified professional who's absolutely killing your career. Um, hey, I'm going to go get some bacon covered dates over there. Good talking with you, right? Uh, you know, and so whatever it is, the, the negative one-liner isn't necessarily um, the words, it, it's how it, that whole thing is making you the center of your story. Um, or I would even add in um, hitting the wrong parts of the story. So maybe finishing a one-liner with the risk instead of the transformation. So, a, you know, might start the one-liner, great. I gather families around the piano. And if you don't use me to service your piano, your family is going to hate you. They're never going to play the piano and you're gonna feel like a bad mother for the rest of your life. Hey, do you wanna use me? <laughs> now I'm being extreme here, but you know, you can end on a risk. And the, actually the risk, if you go back and watch this recording that we identified was, um, I think the risk in that first example was, um, uh, you don't have to go through life thinking you can't play well. So even in this example, a poor one-liner would be, um, you know, I gather family around the piano so you don't have to go through life thinking you can't play well. And it's like, wait a minute, that's, where does that leave me? Like, it just leaves me disjointed. It leaves me feeling bad. Like, where, where were you going with that? And so you can end on the wrong thing, ending on success. I gather families around the piano so you can actually enjoy and be a better pianist. Great, but you didn't actually tell me I could transform from this to this. So there was a stronger ending to that one-liner as well. Um, I'll shut up now and see what George has on the positive front. <laughs> I think you, you bought me some time here, which is great. <laughs> um, so to be honest, one of the first things I, I did when I start thinking about things like, well, what are some, some really solid philosophical needs? I personally started by just putting myself in the situation of what are some of the places where a piano is? What are the rooms that pianos are in? And what, it, what is the transformation that a piano can create? Um, you know, throw in a little bit of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and ask yourself, you know, how does a piano create a sense of belonging? Or what kind of need does that fill? So I'll, th I'll throw two at you that I thought of. Um, first, parents. So let's say that you, your focus really is uh, that your business serves p parents and in, in particular piano teachers, right? So you know how kids just don't like to practice? Well, I make the piano more enjoyable to sit down to, right? So here we have an external problem, external. here we have a philosophical problem of kids just don't enjoy playing piano or, or, or the, the, the you know the conflict that kids, parents and kids have, the fight that they have when we're getting their kids to practice the piano? I make that go away by making the piano more enjoyable. 
Booyah, right there. Bingo. <laughs> That's beautiful. Can I write that down? I love it. <laughs> Um, so uh, honestly, so that 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 was that was one. The other one I got stuck on is I personally love uh, when I walk uh, through a church, and there's some eleven year old boy who's playing the piano. That's one of my personal favorite moments. Um, and there and there's always it was some kid who's just sat down and been learning something. So um, looking at this, you know, um, some people, you know, some people look back on their life and they regret never having learned how to play an instrument, I make sure they don't give up too soon. I make sure that they practice more. I make sure I, I, I keep their piano in tune so that they don't walk away. Again, I'm just throwing off the cuff here, but I think it really is just sitting down and asking yourself in your business, think about the rooms you've been in, the people you've listened to, the customers that you've talked to, and ask yourself, what is it that they really are saying? And when I left, what is it that they said they're gonna do next? They'll give you hints. They will, they, will, they will tell you what their internal problem is. If you listen, they'll start to, to hint at that. Um, and honestly, if you don't have the answer today, over the next week, over the next month, just listen a little bit closer to your customers and start taking notes, right? So I walked in, and while I was working on their piano, they came in and they said, yeah, I just can't really get him to practice. And I'm hoping that maybe this will solve that, okay? For this customer, you've just heard possibly an internal problem, maybe even the philosophical. Um, so really get into the bottom of finding a good one. You'll know it when you hear it because you'll, you'll start recognizing. They weren't talking about tuning right there. They were talking about something deeper. Yeah. You know, those, those were great, George. Um, I, I had two thoughts as you're reading those things. One, where's my pen and paper? I need to like, right. Uh, but um <laughs> There, there was a part of me when we were writing all the content for this webinar, I said, like, what is it going to look like for a bunch of piano service companies to all take this material and apply it? And I think what you just saw in George was shooting off the cuff. There are so many variety of different ways that you can apply this stuff and actually never even hear a repetition. There's actually a way that if somebody else was doing this in the city, you know, the beautiful thing is that a lot of other businesses will read your website and they won't even know what's going on behind the scene. They're just gonna read it and you'll start hearing like, man, that's a really good website. I started hearing that from my customers. It was like, you know, I actually deleted content from my website. I deleted about 60% of the content I had on my website when I went through this process. And I just simplified it down to, you know, character guide, plan, uh, failure, success, transformation. Um, and customers started telling me over and over again, oh my goodness, I feel like your website is like mounds better right now. I mean, it just went through this whole overnight transformation. And I'm thinking, I deleted a bunch of stuff. And the reality is I actually was getting through to them. So there's so many ways that this will come across. And I even, I have like the, the primary central philosophical problem that I ended up with for the brand that I created. Uh, but it took me about nine months from being in the seat that you're in today to having a rough idea um, of what and how to say all of this. And I had a lot of work to do in my business. I, I didn't have a lot of low hanging fruit at that point. And so it was, it was a rough nine months. And then it took about a year and a half before I would say I was really adept at standing in front of a customer. And here's what I would do actually. Uh, I realized I was really bad at seeing the philosophical problem. And so I walked into a customer's home and it was real obvious what the external problem was. The piano sounded like crud and didn't play well. And I could easily find the internal problem, but it was like blankness came over me when I was sitting there staring at them. And I just decided one day, I am not going to say a word until I can identify this customer's philosophical problem. And let me tell you, it was awkward the first few times I did that because I walked in, put my tools down, looked the customer in the eye and said, so tell me about your piano. And I sat there and I refused to say a word until I felt like I had a good grasp on what their philosophical problem was. And if I couldn't figure it out, I just kept asking questions about them and about their piano. How does it fit in life? How does it fit here? Uh, and then finally I would, oh, okay, I think that's it. And then I would say, okay, great. 
um, you know, and I would try to in the moment actually come up with something that sounded something like, you know, well, here's the thing. Um, most of my customers struggle with this philosophical problem. And it, honestly, it's true. A lot of them did. Um, and it would be the philosophical problem they just told me, even though they weren't aware of it. So I would just say, you know, most people struggle with this philosophical problem. Um, I'm here to fix that so you can absolutely enjoy your piano, or I'm here to fix it so you can transform from this to this, or I'm here, you know, kind of like what George was doing. If this was a parent, somebody who wasn't, who was struggling to take lessons, whatever it was, that is where it took me about a year and a half of practicing that at every appointment before it just became second nature. And now I walk into a customer's home or I walk into a situation and I'm sitting there listening and I'm just like philosophical problem, internal problem, external problem. Okay, so if I'm going to help this person, I need to be speaking over here at the philosophical, not over here at the external. Um, and so, yeah, so I think those are really good examples of just the negative side of it, the positive side of it. And then, you know, maybe what this looks like as you start you're stumbling over your words and trying to figure out, because if you're like me, man, you've been speaking to the external problem since day one. It's obvious, it's clear, it's there, and that is not the way to build a brand. And that was a rude awakening for me. Okay, next question. Um, how would someone handle the storytelling for different client types, such as private clients versus institutional venue recording studio? Uh, many technicians may have more than one major customer type, but only have one business website which, um, with which to tell the customer's story. Yeah, um, George touched on this a little bit earlier. Um, we're, we'll cover this more in depth, like the tactical stuff of how to do this um, on your website, but you can do it one of two ways. You can do it through the idea of bucketing where your homepage is really this big general philosophical problem. So let's just, for example, take a very diverse piano service company that does everything, right? We sell pianos, we move pianos, we uh, rebuild pianos, and we service pianos in your home, okay? The philosophical problem that they have is going to be general about the idea of having a piano in your life. And where are the people who can actually take you from not owning a piano to owning a piano and servicing it and enjoying it throughout the lifetime that you have that instrument? Um, we're, the, we're the company that transforms you from somebody who has a piano you grew up on that wasn't inspiring into somebody who um, ends up having a piano that gets passed on through the generations. Right, we're the kind, so it's this big, broad philosophical problem at the top of it. Then you bucket them, and bucketing isn't hundred percent of what you do. It's just like your, you know, eighty percent of the core services you offer. What are you interested in? So this is what we do for people. What are you interested in? Tuning a seasonal service, purchasing a piano, piano moving, piano rebuilding. Now, underneath each of those buckets is the same idea. You're going to take them through the same story, but now you're going to customize it. You know, so they click on tuning and service and it's this funnel. It just keeps getting clearer and clearer. And really what you end up doing is you tell the same story in a slightly different way for rebuilding that you do for tuning a seasonal service with the big philosophical problem being the one unifying foundation and top of the funnel that gets people to come in and want to use your business. Um, there's a lot more like how you do that tactfully, both on your website and other places we'll cover next month. Um, and then another way is you can have different websites, uh, one for moving, one for this. That's a complex way of doing it, probably not the best. Or you can have landing pages, um, and we'll cover all of that stuff kind of next month. Um, uh, was there a second part of that problem, or George, do you want to jump in? Well, I, th I think um, you spoke to a really specific technical way of, of expressing that, right? And, and the one way you said was pretty much have a big, a large philosophical problem that we then get deeper in. And I would say another way is to take a step back and ask yourself, what is it? At some point, you decided that this is your clients, right? That you have both a couple of personal, you have some recording studios. Um, and I think if you start to step back and ask yourself, what is the thing that is the same across these? You might suddenly find that all of your private clients are all really interested in just having a piano that sounds great, right? So 
once you start looking at all of those clients together, you might be able to tease out a large philosophical problem that does cross all of their interests and needs. Um, another question I would toss out there to think about is that when you're dealing with institutional clients, there are decision makers and there are influencers. And it's really easy to think of institutions as, as this large you know, conglomerate, but they're made up of individuals and those individuals have aspirations as well. And somebody in there has an aspirational identity um, that, that has to do with this piano. Even uh, professors who are teaching on these pianos have a very specific thing. Um, so asking yourself, who are the influencers? Who are the decision makers and, and why? You know, decision makers might only care about your price. And we talk about price in a different webinar. So the, they're, 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 gonna, they're gonna skip your problem. They're gonna skip your story. They're gonna straight to your price page and say, well, what are the prices here? But somebody had to hand it to them. Somebody gave it to them. That influencer brought it to them. And that influencer is the one that got hooked by your story. Um, so asking yourself, again, who are the people that I'm actually speaking to? What do they have all in common? And if you can't find something that they all have in common, then I would say then looking at ways that you might even bucket them completely separate, like, like Tim was saying, or large philosophical and then funnels into different buckets. Yeah. And, you know, something I did at the very beginning of this process when I went through it is I had already collected over 400 online reviews. And I went and reread every single one of the reviews. And instead, I just skipped all the parts where they said, he solved my external problem, right? <laughs> Some people gave a review and it was just like, oh, the piano sounded great. And I was like, okay, I'm going to skip that. That doesn't give me anything. I went to all the reviews where there was always this like transformation that happened or there was this success that happened where they gave, they kind of peeled back the curtain. I, I was worried about this and he, he made me feel comfortable. I was concerned about this and I was like, okay, there's my internal problem. And I started identifying their internal problems that they were telling me in these online reviews. And then I found even more reviews actually touched on that, that transformation that happened. And that's where I was like, okay, bingo. So what my customers are already telling me about this is, you know, X, Y, and Z, and I can ignore the external. I'm grateful to know the internal, but really I honed in on that philosophical problem. And I started realizing that there was this idea that was just a common denominator through a lot of them. And that's what helped shape the direction of the brand that I built. Um, and then if you don't have that benefit of already having past reviews from people uh, who told you, um, go to your customers and just ask them. Go to everybody who did business with you last year. Get 100 people to tell you, why did you ultimately choose me? And what happened after I left? And 20 or 30 of them might reply. And that's really where you just listen and read, and I guarantee you, they're gonna all start saying the same thing. And if you're like me though, you probably are going to have a lot of people just tell you and regurgitate the external problem you solved because my brand, before I went through this process, essentially identified an external problem and promised to solve the external problem so they could be really great people who didn't have an external problem anymore. I was very heavy on the external problem and so a lot of my feedback was actually, well, you told me you to fix my external problem and you fix my external problem. And I really like having my external problem fixed. So if you've had that brand for a while, some of the feedback might be that way. Just, you know, shove it to the side and really hone in on the people that, you know, um, talk to you about the philosophical and the transformation that happened. Yeah, Tim, I got to, I just want to repeat what you just said there, right? The idea of reverse engineering. Yes. The, yeah. the stuff that you got. I, and I'm going to point out a way to do this that's not even in your own reviews, right? If you go on Amazon and look at the reviews, how many of us come across things that say, oh, I don't actually know how this works, but I gave it to my grandkid and they liked it, right? I don't know. So because in the end, the philosophical problem that was being solved by that toy that was purchased was my grandkid liked me. They smiled. Yeah. It doesn't matter what the toy was. Right, so I don't even, I never find out if the toy was any good, if it lasted, if it broke, or not that kind of thing, because I found out really how this thing spoke to their philosophical problem. So, yeah. you go through. If you're having a hard time discovering these, honestly, go through a couple of Amazon reviews for some product, doesn't matter which one, and just read the reviews and look for philosophical problems, so you can start to sharpen this skill. Then go back to your yes. own reviews yeah. and reverse engineer them if you're finding that you're having a hard time doing it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And if you're if you're standing here thinking like, oh, my goodness, I feel like I'm just having a hard time seeing all of this. Like, that's normal. That's exactly where you need to be, because most people are really bad at this. Uh, most people, most small business owners are horrible at this. They've never put in the work to actually think about their brand this way. And they're, they're so ingrained in what they do, they either can't articulate why they do it, or they've just never given an, enough thought to it. And, you know, that's normal. What I can tell you being on the other side of this was it's much easier than you probably feel like right now you already have a brand. You already have a why. It is actually sitting on the tip of your tongue. You just don't have words to put to it. Mm -hmm. And the work you're going to do in this process is going to help you put those words to the story. And as you start identifying various parts of the story, and I identified, you know, probably five different stories I could tell with my business going through this. And then once I like wrote those stories out, it was like, oh, this is the story I would be really excited about telling over and over and over and over again. And that's where I went. Um, and so if you're struggling with that now, that's normal. Um, it's actually not as hard as you think to get to the other side of this, but it is going to just take some intentionality. So. Yeah. Well, cause Tim, this work is humbling, right? Yeah. Because we spend so much time trying to get good at our craft and then discover that all of that is really important to make us good at our craft. But it's not the thing that made them book. Yes. That's hard to swallow, to actually come to terms with that. That in the end, they expect our craft to be good. But to choose us over the next guy, that it, it actually goes back to being about them. And that's yes. that is a humbling experience. Yes. But I it will grow your business. I never felt like a worse business owner than this is like one of the low points in my business when I'd been in business for over a decade and it finally hit me. I had missed the mark on branding this entire time. And then it hit me that I had spent hundreds of hours wasted trying to build an amazing website. And really I just like littered it with a bunch of words that didn't matter. And it was time to delete that entire thing and start over. That was humbling. Uh, but that was also a really good place to be. And I'm so glad I went through that work because it made me a better business owner. And it had that has nothing to do with the fact that I'm a registered piano technician, that I love fixing pianos. I love the client interactions. I love all of that. I was a horrible business owner. And now I'm a better business owner because I went through this. We have a question from an, uh, looks like an, an existing uh, Gazelle subscriber um, has a question about how this, this relates. Um, I'll, I'll give a little background, bit of background here for um, uh, anybody joining us who's not a Gazelle subscriber. Uh, we have a feature called our master service list, which lets you describe all of the services that you provide and lets you publish them onto your self-scheduling website where customers can schedule their own appointments. Um, so this question has to do with the master service list. He asks, how can these concepts translate to the verbiage used on my master service list, which shows through on the self-service portal? For example, let's say that you offer regulation. How do you strike a balance between exp explaining what they're paying for, yeah. but not getting too far into the technical jargon? Great question. Um, we'll, we'll talk about how to order your master service list next month a lot more in the website because it kind of ties in with what is that customer experience once they've decided this this webinar is all about like getting them to decide to click that book now button you know and you want to have a smooth experience on the other side of that and they're going to be hitting the services that you've outlined in your master service list as they book their appointment right so we'll cover a lot of the technical stuff next month but one thing i will say is uh, gazelle's already done the heavy lifting for you in that our service library that has hundreds and hundreds of common services with descriptions, we actually already paid somebody who was versed in storytelling. And when we told them to write those descriptions, we went to them and we said, we want you to write a description that covers a problem, presents us as a guide and leaves the customer with the risk because the fulfillment of solving that risk is the book now. It's the, I'm confirming my appointment. So there is a point, earlier I said in your one-liner, you don't wanna leave people with the risk. 
But if you look at the descriptions, every single description we wrote about every single service, even stuff as complex as regulation, when you give an estimate in Gazelle and you're using the description we provided, it basically says, this solves this problem in your life. We're a great knowledgeable guide. And if you do nothing, here's the risk that your piano will not function in this way. Um, and it leaves them there. Because to fulfill on that estimate, to click the buy now on the estimate, to click the book now on the services that they're reading, um, that's the, the next step in their plan for solving this problem that's been identified in their life. Yeah, that's great. And uh, I wanted to show real quick, actually, if I could, um, if, if you're in um, uh, here, just a second. Oh, this isn't going to work. Um, well, never mind. Don't worry about it, Luke. We can figure <laughs> out a way to show it next month or get to the person. Yep. Yep. I was just going to show how to get to the master service list. Um, all right. Well, that is actually all the questions that we have. Um, do you guys have anything else uh, that you wanted to share? No, thank you for coming out, everybody. We're really excited to be doing these again. We're going to be clicking through these like clockwork this year. Um, we're super excited about next month's webinar. And uh, it's, again, we're going to be building on a lot of these concepts to help you build a really powerful and simple website. Uh, so stay tuned.